All right, we are live. Hey, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with another live video Q&A for the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. So if you can hear me and see me, and this is coming through loud and clear on your end, please let me know by typing into the chat window and make sure that this is coming through and working fine. It seems to be going fine on my end. Fingers crossed. It's coming through loud and clear on your end. And as you log into the, the video chat this evening, just let me know where you're tuning in from, right? Where are you located? What time is it in your local area? And also let me know if you are new to the video chats or if you're a regular. So if you're new, type the letter N into the chat window, right? That'll let me know that you're new and we'll give you extra special treatment, right? New new viewers get extra special treatment to the video chats. And if you're a regular, type the letter R. I'll still give good treatment to the regulars as well. I mean, but it's nice, you know, when we have new people joining in, it's always nice to see the, the channel growing. So let me know. We have Saul joining in. We've got Neil joining in. We've got Maddie joining in. Some regulars I'm saying it's coming through loud and clear. Maddie's joining us from the Caribbean. We have Saul from Texas. Uh, we have No Name joining us from the UK. All right, Mr. No Name over in the UK. Welcome. Must be getting late over in the UK. <clears throat> I was a little later than normal starting these video chats. Normally I start at 5 Eastern, uh, but my mother-in-law is visiting us. And we had dinner, and I was a bit later than normal starting because of course I had to have dinner with the family normally when i do these video chats i have a late dinner all right so I, I do my video chat first and then i have dinner afterwards but this evening we uh we had dinner with the family and that's why i was a little bit later all right so just uh, acknowledging why it's a bit late for those of you who are regulars and you know hey lee normally goes live at 5 p.m eastern time well that's the reason why all right, so the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next little while. I'm actually going to cut this chat short. I'm probably only going to stick around for about a half hour today because I got a lot of things on my plate, and I'll explain that in, in the chat here. But the way these work is I'm going to be hanging out here and answering your questions and topics of discussion. So if there's anything that you would like to discuss with regards to fitness, nutrition, exercise, building muscle, losing fat, whatever it is, any challenges or questions or topics that you would like to uh, talk about, post those questions or topics of discussion into our chat window, and I'll do the best I can to help you out over the course of our chat today. Now, in my case, the reason why I have to cut it short is, one, got the mother-in-law upstairs <coughs> visiting first, and tomorrow is a big adventure day for me. I'm, I'm doing a sportif bicycle ride and it's going to be my biggest bicycle ride yet. Over this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we're doing what's known as the Irish Loop in Newfoundland. So it's a loop of the southern shore, and it's 320 kilometers. 322 kilometers, I think, is the total loop, somewhere in that vicinity, which is approximately, it's, it's over 200 miles. So it's a big, big ride. And I mean, I've done big rides before. I've done a 100-mile ride last year, but it was just one day. But to get up the next morning and then do it all over again, that's what's going to test work capacity and stamina and recovery and all that kind of stuff. So this weekend, I'm going to be doing my biggest ride yet, which is 322 kilometers. Uh, day one is like 100 and. 70 something kilometers and then the remaining on day two so uh, there's longer distance on day one but there's more climbing on day two so it's going to be challenging for sure and this is a, a big group ride there's 40 of us participating in it and we're going to be spending the night down in uh, Trapassi, spending a night at the a little hotel down there so it's part of a, a big group ride it's called the Trapassi posse and i'll be uh participating in that and this is my first time doing that ride but this has been going on for for years so it's just something that i've been working towards training for over the past uh, you know several weeks building up my conditioning and my stamina for this so i'm looking forward to putting myself on the uh, to the paces and to the test tomorrow to see how things go and according to the forecast it's looking like it should be nice it should be warm and mostly dry which will be uh, nice because here in newfoundland we've had a very cold june We've called it January because most mornings I've been waking up to single-digit temperatures. 
So it's nice to finally get some warm weather coming through. All right, so let's see what we got coming through here. We have Saul's asking, what's your favorite meal while cutting? Well, let me clarify this first. I'm not a huge fan of cutting and bulking, but I know what you're getting at. Like, what's your favorite meal when you're prioritizing fat loss? And I, I have several meals that I, I go to when it comes to fat loss. And my big thing is I need to fill up uh, and I need to have volume and satiation. So one of my go-to meals that I eat a lot when I'm cutting, I eat a lot of salads. I eat a lot of chicken and high volume foods like that. So at least once a day, I have a large garden salad with a chopped up chicken breast. That's one of my go-to meals when I'm on a fat loss program. Uh, another one that I have a lot of, uh, my high protein blender ice cream. And I've made several videos sharing this one, but basically what it is, it's um, mixing up egg whites, protein powder, frozen berries, mix it up in a blender and mix it up so thick that you can eat it with a spoon. And this is really good because it's high in protein, low in fat, low in sugar, and it's very high in volume and it's tastes delicious. I mean, it tastes like you're eating like an ice cream, frozen yogurt type of dessert and you get to eat a lot of it. I mean, a whole blender full of it for you know, only a you know, few hundred calories and primarily those calories are coming from protein. So that's another big one of mine. Uh, another favorite uh, breakfast meal that I usually have is high protein oatmeal. So I'll mix up uh, oatmeal and then put in protein powder with it. That's another one. And I like that because it's very filling and satiating. And again, it tastes good. Uh, other things that I eat a lot of when I'm uh, focusing on fat loss, like meat and vegetable stir fries. And that's one of my go-to habits is whenever I think of a meal, I want to focus on protein and vegetables, protein and vegetables, especially when you're training for fat loss. That's what, that's what you should fill up on. And those are the high nutrient dense foods, the high volume foods that are going to give you the nourishment you need, fuel your body on the cellular level, but keep the calories in check. So you get to fill your belly and make it feel like you're eating a lot of food, a lot of food volume that is, but you're not eating a lot of calories. And that's my secret to staying to a fat loss meal plan. And I actually have videos on this. Um, what I'll do is in the replay, uh, I'll post a link to a, a video where I actually go into detail sharing some of my strategies for incorporating higher volume foods uh, so you get that eating satiation while still keeping your calories in check. All right, we got Neil joining in. Uh, we have Saul joining in. Maddie joining in. No name is saying, Lee, I'm having trouble getting my arms to grow. What's your advice? Should I try and train them more? I'm from the UK. All right, when it comes to arm training, you could try training them more. And you really got to look at the bigger picture and, and see like what's causing that plateau to begin with. Because if you're new to training, then I would just focus on training all your major muscle groups and balance and proportion and focus on getting bigger and stronger all over. And, and even if you're more advanced, you still want to focus on getting bigger and stronger all over. Generally speaking, for every 10 pounds of muscular body weight you gain, you're going to put an inch on your upper arms, right? So put that in perspective. Like if you want bigger arms, you generally got to get bigger and stronger all over. But if proportion wise, the arms are lagging behind the rest of your physique, then you can prioritize them. And this was a case for me because my arms do lag behind the rest of my physique and I really had to work on them uh, to, to bring them up. And I mean, even now they still lag behind. Like I've got my, my chest, my back, my, my legs, especially my calves, like those are all my stronger body parts. Arms are still lagging behind proportion wise. So I really have to prioritize them to keep them in balance. And one of the things that I have done in the past to really focus on that is increasing the volume of the arm training. So doing arm specialization. And I actually wrote a book on it. It's called Blast Your Biceps. And that's uh, available. It's in a downloadable ebook. So if you go to blastyourbiceps.com, uh, you'll be able to pick up a copy of that if you want. But that's that's what I would recommend. Like that's a lays out the whole thing, you know, in, in detail, step by step, covering the workouts, the strategies, even nutrition tactics that you can use so that you're gaining lean muscular body weight and prioritizing your arms at the same time. But I'll give you a summary of it here, uh, you know, in the video. And basically what it involves is prioritizing your arms while putting your stronger body parts on maintenance mode. So we'll train arms twice a week and all your other major muscle groups once a week. 
So for example, like your chest, your back, your legs, shoulders, they all get trained once a week. Biceps and triceps get trained twice a week. And one workout is a heavier power orientated workout, if you will. And the other one is more higher repetition, higher volume, more time under tension, utilizing more isolation exercises. So one is more compound exercises, one's more isolation, one's heavier, lower reps, one's lighter, higher reps. So we're incorporating both styles of training. So you're getting the fast twitch muscle fiber as long as the slow twitch muscle fiber to help maximize growth. And you're getting the power as well as the volume and the time under tension. And that has been a very powerful program. I mean, that worked well for me to help bring up my arms to a to the next level. And a lot of my coaching students have utilized it as well to really bring up stubborn arms. So again, if, if you're looking for a, a, a complete done for you arm specialization training program, uh, head on over to blastyourbiceps.com. All right. And that's that's a website. I mean, I started that years ago, but it's it's still available, it's still online, still legit. So go check it out. All right, what else we got there? Uh, Neil saying, he says, I'm a regular, but I want the newbie treatment <laughs> from the Philippines at 525 AM. Well, congrats on being up early or late, whichever way you want to look at it. I don't know. He says he's halfway through his shift. Okay. So this is late for you. Really late <laughs> when you get to the wee hours of the morning late. All right. Uh, 10 PM over in the UK. Gotcha. We have Larry joining in from Pittsburgh. Welcome. We have Philly Josh joining in. Welcome, welcome. Uh, have you done a live workout on your YouTube channel before? That's from Maddie. Um, have I done a live work? I've done several on Facebook, but I'm not sure if I've done them on YouTube before. I, what I've done is during when the whole start of the pandemic hit a couple years ago and everything was in lockdown, the world was in lockdown and everybody had no access to gyms. I was doing some live uh, follow along home workouts using dumbbells and resistance bands and pretty much basic stuff that you can utilize at home. And I was doing live follow along workouts on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook channel or Facebook page, I should say. And then I would sometimes share the recording of those on my YouTube channel. So technically, I didn't do them on YouTube, but I have a ton of them over on Facebook. If you head on over to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Facebook page, you'll see them there. There's over 30 follow-along live workouts that I've done. Yeah. And, I mean, it might be something that I do, a live workout. The problem with the live workouts is... It, it, it's tedious because you know you're setting up the camera and then you got to go and do the exercise and then of course I got to rest in between sets and you and you know you get all that de dead time if you will <laughs> during the workout whereas when you pre-record a video you know you can cut to the chase so to speak now with that being said some people like the experience of the live workout like you know like the the delays if you will oh here he is setting up the camera oh he's sitting down taking a rest between sets you know some people like just the feeling of being there live, even though it's, you know, not the most, uh, <laughs> not the most exciting time to sitting there watching someone take a rest break between sets. But, you know, hey, if, if there's a demand for it, maybe we'll do one. Uh, we got John joining in. Uh, this is Lee is the high, low, high cable flies good for the front chest pose to build a bigger chest and dumbbell pullovers low high cable fly so I, I guess you mean alternating low pulley as well as the high pulley yeah you can do that i mean i generally if i'm doing cable crossovers which i'm guessing that's what you mean when you say cable flies cable crossovers uh, i'm more often than not doing from the high pulley i have done them from the low pulley and, and you know you, you kind of do get a, a unique pump i guess in the upper chest that way but i find that the high pulley cable crossover is where I feel the most chest activation when you're coming down, right? Almost, almost resembling a most muscular pose, if you will. So that's what I do most of the time. But if, if you have access to different pulleys, like high and low, or even better, the adjustable ones where you can move it up and down and, and even do them in the middle, then that's even better. And you can experiment and see what angle works the best for you, right? Um, but yeah, either one is, is a great way to just work the chest. And the cool thing about the cable fly is you're getting the stretch as well as the peak contraction because there's constant tension throughout the entire range of motion. Whereas with a dumbbell fly, 
it's mostly a stretch exercise, but as you bring the dumbbells together, there's not a lot of tension at the top and you actually get a rest at the top and all the tensions in the bottom. So with the cables, you get constant tension throughout the entire range of motion. And that's one of the benefits to certain machine exercises, depending on the movement and everything else, you actually get more continuous tension and more steady muscle stimulation throughout the entire range of motion. And that's the case with the cable fly for sure. Uh, dumbbell pullovers. I actually don't do dumbbell pullovers very much because we have a, a cool Nautilus pullover machine available at the gym that I train at up at Platinum Fitness. They've got the old school Nautilus pullover. And if you've never seen this one before, um, like look at some of the old Dorian Yates videos because he used to use it in his videos, the old school Nautilus pullover. I mean, it's, it's not cables and pulleys, it's chains and sprockets, right? The thing was built the last and it's old. I don't have, I don't know how old it is, but Man, it's got to be 30, 40 years old or more. But the, it's it's old school machine, but man, it works. And the old Nautilus equipment, you know, the stuff that was built with chains and pulley, or chains and sprockets, I meant to say, instead of cables and pulleys, like you're not breaking a chain. And it's a thick chain. It's not like a bicycle chain. It's more like a motorcycle chain or something. Like it's, it's big. It's a massive sprocket and a massive chain. And like there's no way you're snapping that thing off, right? So it's it's built the last. And the one that they got up at uh, Platinum, I love it. It's it's my favorite pullover variation, right? You get a nice deep stretch, and then as you pull it all the way, you get the full peak contraction. So there's constant tension throughout that entire range of motion. And I, I usually alternate it. So I'll do one set with a palms overhand grip and then another set with the mm -hmm. underhand grip. And I find, like, when you do the underhand, you get more of that lower lat activation, the overhand. It, it just provides unique stimulation all around. So stretches out the torso, works the lats. Phenomenal exercise. But with that being said, if you don't have access to a pullover machine, uh, you can do dumbbell pullovers or barbell pullovers as a good alternative. Right? But the pullover machine is far superior, in my opinion, to the free weights in that situation. Uh, John saying, good luck with the bike rides. Appreciate it, my friend. I'm going to need it. <laughs> going to need all the luck I can get. I want good luck with the weather. I want good luck with the uh, with the, the traffic and all that kind of stuff, right? Hopefully it all goes well. You know? And good luck with the energy, right? Avoid the bonk. Uh, what else we got there? Neil's saying, Lee, what are your thoughts on deloading? This week has been rough and I haven't reached my regular reps and my logs, like I'm two reps short on my last sets. Awesome question. And this is something that I can talk with with experience because this has been a deloading week for me uh, with my training. Like for example, the, the training that I've been doing leading up to this bike race, or it's not a race, it's, it's a sportive, right? It's, it's a group ride, but a big one. Um, the training I've been doing leading up to this, I've been building up to a peak up until last week. So last week was my peak in volume and this week was a deload. So I scale back the intensities, scale back the volume and just kind of going through the motions. And the reason is because I want to recover, right? So I worked up to a peak and then this week just still trained, like I'm still doing cycling, still doing weight training, but the, the intensity was just scaled back. And I'm literally like going through the motions, if you will. And that allows you to still maintain your fitness, but you, you allow your body to rest and recover because you're not overtaxing it. So this is what you want to do when, when a deload phase is, it's active recovery and active recovery is actually better than doing nothing at all. Because when you do nothing at all, you actually start to decondition and, and, and lose, lose some of your fitness. But when you do active recovery, you're still reaping the benefits of, of regular exercise. You're getting the movement, you're getting the blood flow and the circulation and, and the, the limber and the mobility and all that, all those positive aspects of exercise. You're still getting all that, but you're not stressing your central nervous system. You're not taxing your recovery abilities and you're not stressing your body. Like you're not pushing to failure and beyond. You're literally just going through the motions, stopping short of failure. Like visualize going through a workout, just doing warm up sets. Like that's what it feels like. Like you just go through a warm up set and like, okay, that was easy. And then, you know, you do a few easy sets of an exercise and then move on a few easy sets of an exercise and move on. And that's what I've been doing over the past week. And it's very rejuvenating because those workouts, you leave them, feeling energized like you don't feel drained and then after a few of those active recovery workouts you start to build up your natural energy reserves again 
So you're still like teaching your body the movement patterns. You're still ingraining all those positive habits. You're not just sitting on the sofa, you know, eating potato chips <laughs> and then watching Netflix, right? You're still living an active lifestyle, but you're just not pushing the volume or the intensity. And it actually allows you to recover faster. And even for people who are like going through, like if you're recovering from an injury or something like that, find ways that you can stay active, right? Like active recovery is better than doing nothing because at least you're still getting the blood flow and the endorphins and, and all the, the health benefits of regular movement, regular exercise without stressing your body and breaking down the muscles. Like you're actually rebuilding them and helping that blood flow and circulation helps the, the process along. So that's the whole purpose behind deloading, right? And if you're feeling that you're not only have you hit a plateau, but now you're starting to lose strength, that's a sure sign that you've hit your peak in terms of this round, like, like this round of, of fitness, you're, you're maxed out. Like, you know, you're pushing the limits of overtraining and you're, you're at the stage now where you can't even duplicate what you could before. Not only are you at a plateau, but you're actually losing strength. Once you're at that phase, what you need to do is, is just literally scale back the intensity. Uh, another thing that's helpful as well is sometimes changing up the exercises, like change up the routine you're doing, change up the movement patterns and focus on providing some unique muscle stimulation. So what I would do for the first week, literally go through the motions, literally like warm up sets. That's all. Don't go any harder than that. Don't push yourself to failure, right? Like leave the gym feeling like this was an easy workout, like, that's what you want to feel like. This is easy. I'm just going through the motions. And then when you do start training in the following week, what I would do is change up the movement patterns. So I'll give you an example. Like if you're always doing barbell bench press, well, how about you do like an incline dumbbell press? You know, if you're normally doing barbell squats, then maybe do a hack squat or a leg press or some other variation. Um, if if you're with your deadlifts, if you're always doing a conventional deadlift, then try a sumo deadlift. I don't know if with your biceps, if you're doing barbell curls, try dumbbell curls. Like just, just try different exercise variations that still work the same muscles, but with different movement patterns. All right. So just change it up and that will provide some unique muscle stimulation. And then start off the first week back, go light. And then the next week, just go a little bit heavier, but still not killing yourself. And then just gradually, week by week, build up the volume, build up the intensity, and, and just try to do a little better than you did before, right? A little better than you were before. That's each, each week, right? Just make small baby jumps. And then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to hit a new peak, a new plateau with these new exercises. And then once you do that, then you can, you'll start to hit this adapt, grow, plateau. Like every workout program you follow goes through this adapt, grow, plateau, adapt, grow, plateau. Once you hit that plateau phase, then deload, change it up, and go through the process again. So it's almost like build up to ramp, back it off, build up to a ramp, back it off. And with each ramp, you're taking things to another level, right? So it's the whole idea like behind deload is like one step back so you can take two steps forward. That's that's kind of the premise behind it. And everybody has to go through this. Like you'll see professional athletes go through this. Everybody has to go through deloading phase if you're pushing yourself hard and consistently enough. Now, the problem with average people is they're not consistent enough. They're always on and off again with their workouts. So they're getting like they're not pushing the limits of their recovery abilities before they're taking time off. You know, you see, I, I was actually talking to some of my coaching students today. Right. I won't mention any names, but like this is their this is their excuse. Like they're like, oh, I got busy with work. I got busy with this and I'm busy with family and blah, blah, blah. So I worked out for a few weeks and then I ended up having to take two weeks off. And then I got back on it for a week and then I had to take another week off and then on and off, on and off. And the problem with on and off is whatever progress you make when you're on, you lose when you're off, right? So you don't want this on and off. You want to be good enough, but good enough consistently. And if you are good enough and good enough consistently, then you are going to reach this phase of adapt, grow, plateau, right? But you need the consistency in there. Like that's that's the missing link for 99% of the people out there who work out. Consistency is what's holding them back. But once you master it and consistency and showing up to the gym day after day is not an issue anymore, then you need to factor in deloading and, and training and altering your intensity levels and all that kind of stuff. And it usually goes in ramps, right? So you ramp up to a peak and then once you start to plateau, then you got to back off and then ramp up again. And that's the way the process works. 
All right, let me see what else we got there. Baby Boomers joining in says, Hi, Lee, your insight is helping me cut. Your methods are working. Thanks. Much appreciated. Glad to, glad to hear that you're getting some benefit from us. You're welcome. And Saul is saying thanks, and I'm saying you're welcome. <laughs> Gabriel is joining in, says, I love your live streams. Uh, how do you get rid of, how do I get rid of my X legs? My legs are more developed than my upper body, especially the quads, but no matter how good and hard I train, nothing changes. How do I get rid of X legs? My legs are more developed than my upper body, especially the quads. That's a blessing in disguise. That's like, that's not a, a negative whatsoever. If your legs are more developed than your upper body, like, man, count your lucky stars, right? Pat yourself on the back. That's awesome. Because now you can scale back on leg training. And for most people, leg training is like one of the hardest workouts out there. So in your situation, what I would suggest, train legs once a week and train upper body twice a week. So prioritize the upper body and then put legs on kind of like a, a more maintenance type program. And however, you, like there's different ways of going about it, but bottom line, f train your upper body more than you train your legs. So if, for example, if you could hit all your major upper body muscle groups twice a week, legs once a week. And that's probably the way I would do it if, if it was me. I mean, if it was really extreme, you could probably even train your legs like every couple weeks and then, you know, focus on training your upper body more often. But start with that first. I would start with upper body twice a week legs once a week. So however you structure your workouts, I mean, you might have like a, a push day, a pull day, a leg day, and then, you know, maybe some more upper body work in there, depending on how you structure your schedule. But bottom line, you want to hit all your upper body muscles twice as often as you hit your legs. And that's actually a blessing in disguise because most people are the opposite. The legs are lagging behind the upper body and then they got a double time on the legs and that's hard right? It really is. And I, I can kind of relate to where you're coming from because I was very similar to that myself. Like if you look at some of my early old pictures, like back when I was a teenager, my legs dwarfed my upper body in mass. And part of that was because I was doing a lot of martial arts when I was younger and doing a lot of kicking and stretching and, and holding the horse stance and all that kind of stuff, which really helped to give my legs a head start. And I was also doing a lot of cycling, a lot of running and stuff like that as other exercises. I was also doing skateboarding when I was a kid, like all things that were really taxed the legs. And it was a lot of explosive work, you know, like skateboarding is very explosive. Um, running, you know, playing sports, playing. I played soccer when I was a kid as well. So there was a lot of dominant leg work, not a lot of dominant upper body work. So my legs kind of got a head start over my upper body in my early days. And that really carried over. So uh, when I started bodybuilding, I actually had to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. I had to back off the volume of my leg training and double up the volume of my upper body training to let my upper body catch up. And uh, so that's what you need to do. And that's it's actually advantageous versus having it the other way around. All right. Second. Now I just lost my place. <laughs> I, I touched my touchpad there and the, the chat window just jumped on me. So I lost my place. Give me a second there. We got Dan joining in. We've got the, the Valer, Valeri X edits. I, I know I'm butchering your name, but welcome to the chat. He says, hello, Lee. I hope you have a nice afternoon. Your work is very much appreciated. Well, thank you for the comment. And sorry for butchering your name. It's V. Larry and X edits. V. Larry. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for ch chiming in. <laughs> Gabriel's joining in, says, I've been following since 2010. Nice to have your support. Appreciate it. Uh, Saul saying, your calves are huge. What are your recommended volume for calves if my calves are small? The cool thing about calf training is you can train them quite frequently and it's not going to cause you to overtrain, meaning like you're not going to stress out your central nervous system because you did too many calf raises. Like the calves are a very small muscle group in proportion to the rest of the body. You can train them hard and heavy. And even though the muscles themselves will get a hard workout, it's not exhausting. Like I 
put it in perspective. Like if you do a set of calf raises to failure, you're, yes, the calves themselves will burn and you'll get the, the muscular pain and the pump and all that. But you don't, you're not ending the set feeling exhausted and gasping for air or anything like that. Whereas if you do a set of squats to failure, you're going to feel it all over. You know, or if you do a set of deadlifts to failure, you're going to feel it all over or even bench presses or something like that. Like bigger exercises is going to push a lot more stress on your body. But calves, it, it's basically an isolation exercise. It's a small single joint movement and you, you can train them quite frequently. The only thing you want to be careful of is not overstraining the joints, tendons, and ligaments. You know, like if, if you pull some of the joints, tendons, and ligaments in your ankles or your feet and stuff like that, that could hinder your progress. So you want to be careful of, of those type of repetitive movement injuries. But otherwise, like you can train them quite frequently. And, and for someone who's got stubborn calves, I'd recommend every other day or three days a week. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Like you could do standing calf raises and seated calf raises. Like those are the two big ones. You want to do some exercises with your legs straight and locked out. And then you want to do some leg exercises with your legs bent. And that's going to work the different uh, areas of the calves. Like when your legs are bent, as in a seated calf raise, you're going to work more of the soleus. When your legs are locked out, as in a standing calf raise, more of the gastrocnemius. And those are the two basic areas that you really want to focus on. So a seated calf raise, a standing calf raise, and... You know, if it, it depends on how you want to structure it. Like maybe one day you do standing calf raises, you know, next workout, do seated calf raises and then just alternate them, you know, every other day and focus on just really, I, I would go through, a, I would pyramid the weight up. So start off light, add weight each set until you're struggling to get 10 good reps and then call it a day. So start off really light and just pyramid up multiple sets so you're struggling and then once you hit your peak your top working set you know stop <laughs> and the key with calves that really is going to make or break your progress is how you do the exercise because this is the biggest mistake i see when guys are training calves is they put way too much weight on the machine like you see guys going in there and put the whole weight stack on the standing calf raise and they get in there and they're doing these little short choppy calf raises. You know, they're bouncing up and down in the mid range, never letting their heel sink all the way down, never coming all the way up onto their tippy toes. And they're always just in this little mid range, bouncing up and down a couple inches with way too much weight. Like you'd be much better off, like cut the weight in half and then do a full range of motion. So when, you, when you're doing your calf raises, let your heel sink all the way down so that your toes are stretching like your your toes are on the edge of the foot plate there and your heels are sinking down and you feel that deep stretch into the calf hold that stretch for a second and then come all the way up onto the balls of your feet and flex and squeeze your calves at the top and hold that for a second and I always think stretch and squeeze stretch and squeeze and and do that for for your calf raises and this is what's going to spur on new growth because the calves are very tough dense muscles and they're used to a lot of volume in that mid range. Like you think every time you go walk or climb a flight of stairs or run, jog, move, like every time you take a step, you're doing a little mini calf raise in the mid range. So your calves are used to that. Those little mini mid range, not really getting a full stretch, not really getting a full peak contraction. They're used to that all day long. And if you do a lot of walking, they're really used to it. So in order to spur on unique muscle growth, you need to get outside that mid range. And so that's where the fully stretched and the fully peak contraction. And once you start working in those ranges of motion under progressive overload, your calves have no choice but to grow. All right. So that's what you want to focus on. And again, you can train them quite frequently. As long as you're not painfully sore, you can train your calves and just listen to your body. Like if it gets to the point where like you're feeling painfully sore, either the muscles are or the joints, tendons and ligaments. You know, again, in, in the ankles, the Achilles tendon, even the tendons and set in, in your feet. If that starts to feel sore, like take an extra day or two off to let it rest and recover. But as long as you're feeling good, you can literally train your calves every 48 hours and just keep that momentum going and let them catch up to your body parts. Right. And this is what you should do if you have stubborn calves, because I know it's it's one of those muscles like th this literally applies to all muscle groups, but calves especially. It's like you got them or you don't. Like some people genetically have big calves and some people don't. And if you don't, like you got to work your ass off to get them. But you can still make progress. Like regardless of your genetics and all that, improvement's always possible. So this is how you're going to make improvement with your calves. 
All right, moving on. Let's see what else we got there. Uh, um, let's see. Zach Harrington. Hey, brother. I've been watching you for years. Thanks for inspiring me. You're welcome, Zach. I'm glad, glad you find it inspirational. We have Glenn joining in from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Awesome. I've never been there before. Right? I've been to a lot of places in Canada, but I've never been th to that area. I've, I've been Vancouver and Alberta, been as far as Ontario from the east side, so like Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, Quebec, Ontario, but I've never been in the Midwest, right, that area of Canada, right, throughout the, besides Alberta. So I've, one of these days, I'll have to venture out that way and look at the flatlands. <laughs> Uh, Thomas is joining in saying, hi, Lee, great channel. Just wondering, do you still love working out now as you get older? Uh, smart question because I'm in my forties. <laughs> you know what? I, I do. I, I really do. And I've kind of, this is something that's going to evolve as you evolve. So my priorities have changed a lot. Uh, like back in my early days, it was all about getting bigger and well, I mean, let me back up even further in my early, early, early days. It was all about martial arts, right? So I started off, you know, my, my father and I, we, we, we were doing Kung Fu at, at one of the local martial arts clubs here. So I started off with that. And that was kind of like my priority. And I wanted to be, you know, like, like the, the Bruce Lee and the Chuck Norris and the Van Damme, right? Like that was my inspiration, if you will, back in the early days, right? So I, I was really fascinated with martial arts and, you know, I wanted to focus on that. And my goal was, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a martial artist. So that was my priority for, for years, focusing on that. And then my training was all geared around becoming a better martial artist. So there was a lot of flexibility work, uh, a lot of endurance work, you know, conditioning, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I did that for, 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 for years. And then uh, I switched martial arts clubs over the years. And I, one of my, uh, my Sifu that I was training with at the time, he was a, a recreational bodybuilder, weightlifter. Basically, he lifted weights, right? But he was the biggest and strongest guy that I ever seen in person at that stage of my life, right? Like, this, keep in mind, this is before the internet. So it's not like you can Google search and see everything like we can now. Like, you can Google search powerlifting and bodybuilding, and you're seeing the best of the best. Like, before the days of the internet, you were just seeing who was in your local area, right? So, I mean, just think of, like, who's in your local neck of the woods. And uh, unless you're living, you know, some big crazy city like you're probably not seeing that many elite athletes and that's the way it is from here for me i mean I, when i was growing up there wasn't many elite athletes around put it that way so my martial arts instructor uh, he was the first guy that i ever seen bench press 300 pounds in person and i was like holy shit like that seemed like world's strongest man level to me at the time like 300 pounds that was mind-boggling so like I, I looked up to him like he was a demigod or something like, holy shit, like this man, like he, he's the strongest man in the world as far as I was concerned, right? 300 pound bench press. And he helped me with, with workouts. Now, quite honestly, like when I look back at it now, his level of knowledge when it came to weight training and everything else was shit because it was just stuff that he picked up on his own over the years. But again, he was consistent with it. And like he was one of these all upper body guys, like hardly ever trained legs, but he really wanted to have a big bench press. So he was all like chest and arms and stuff like that. But still, he, he got me motivated by, by that. And I started hanging around with him, started working out with him, like in his basement garage gym that he had there, right? Like a little, it was pretty rough. Like he, he was, we started off working out in his basement and there wasn't even like a concrete floor. It was on like crushed stone. And, and we had to throw sheets of plywood down to prop the bench up on so that it wouldn't be sinking into the crushed stone that he had in the basement. Like it was, it was pretty rugged. The squat rack was made out of two by fours. Right, uh, you know, pull up bar just hanging from the rafters in the ceiling. Like it was a pretty, <laughs> pretty crude gym, but we trained there. Like a whole bunch of the guys from from the dojo used to get together a couple times a week and train at his place. And so he got me more involved with with strength training. And he actually, you know, introduced me to some local powerlifters. And these guys, you know, I, I kind of started to learn from them. And things just kind of progressed from there. And I got more interested in bodybuilding and strength training. And that was kind of taking priority over the martial arts. So after several years of this, he could see that, you know, 
your priority for martial arts isn't there. The passion isn't there, but I can see the passion for, for weight training. Of course, I'm in my mid teens throughout this time. And if you're in your mid teens and you're eating any what decent and you're working out consistently, you're going to make gains. Like everybody who goes through their teenage years gets bigger and stronger, regardless if you work out or not. So if you combine a half ass diet and a half ass workout along with your teenage years, when you're naturally going through puberty, like the gains are astronomical. I mean, when I look back at it now, it's, it's mind boggling to see the gains that I made, but I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have back then because, you know, impatient teenagers, nothing ever happens fast enough. But like I, I, I when I started, I was like 130 pounds when I was by the time I was 19, I was just under 200 pounds. Now, granted, it wasn't all lean mass, but like massive gains. Right. I mean, I just blew up like a balloon. And my strength went through the roof. Like I can remember at 18 years old, bench pressing 350 pounds. Like it was, it was crazy. Like my strength was through the roof. Like I was the strongest kid in high school and all that at the time. So that was my priority. I really wanted to switch to bodybuilding and powerlifting. So that's what I did. And, and then I put martial arts on the back burner because my instructor at the time, he said, like, you can't do it all. He says, like, you know, either focus on martial arts or focus on the bodybuilding and weight training. He said, because you're this all or nothing. Like you can, if you're balancing it out, yeah, you can do both. But in your case, he said like, you're, you're going all in with the bodybuilding and weight training. He said, so if that's your passion, he said, go all in with it. And I listened to his advice. So I went all in with it. And then within the next year, like I was competing in local bodybuilding competitions. So that's where I started to really focus on the bodybuilding side of things. And then I know it's a long winded answer to your question here. But that was my priority for, for, for several years, like going through bodybuilding. And then I, I got involved with powerlifting, met up with some local powerlifters and did some powerlifting meets. And I found that bodybuilding and powerlifting can actually be very complementary because off-season bodybuilding is perfect for in-season powerlifting. And then uh, in-season bodybuilding is perfect for like off-season powerlifting. So you can kind of work them back to back. And that's what I did for a while. Like I was alternating both, like power bodybuilding, if you will. And then I really got more into the competitive side of bodybuilding and for 17 years, I did competitive bodybuilding, right? That was my thing. I did so 17 years, did that. Um, and then I took a hiatus in 2011 was the last time that I did a show. And I took a, a hiatus then until 2021. And I made my comeback to the bodybuilding stage last year. For those of you who've been following along with stuff, you know, I've shared the pictures, especially up on my Facebook and stuff. And so I did that last year, made the comeback, did classic physique in the master's category, and it actually won that. So I was quite pleased with it. And now my, my main goal is like health and fitness and just being as healthy as I can be. And it's not about powerlifting anymore. Like I've, I haven't even attempted a one rep max bench or squat or deadlift, a one rep max anything in over 10 years. And I have no intentions of doing so because I mean, when I have done that in the past, there's been a lot of injuries, you know, like I've torn both biceps. I've, I've, you know, I've torn muscles in my back before and it's those, some of those injuries, you know, they still haunt me today. So I don't want to, uh, you know, put myself at risk of injury. It's all about health and longevity and just being, you know, the best version of me. And of course, now I've really over the last couple of years, even taken up endurance training more so. So getting more involved with cycling and this past, uh, this past spring, well, you know, literally a few months ago, a couple, two, two months ago, I competed in uh, one of our local, uh, road cycling races. And I actually won my division, right? I won the category B class in the, uh, or Pooch Cove classic road bicycle race, which blew my mind. Cause I was going in there just hoping for a personal best. And I ended up winning, winning that race. Right. So, I mean, I was blown away with that and, you know, I started riding with some of the more advanced cyclists. So, and then of course now this weekend, we're going on a big, you know, 300 plus kilometer bicycle ride. So I've been focusing more on the endurance side of things and really building up my work capacity, my stamina. And at this stage of the game, like my cardiovascular fitness is better than it's ever been. Like even back when I was doing martial arts and everything else as a kid, like I've got more cardiovascular stamina and endurance than I ever have. So my fitness goals is kind of like to maintain my strength in the gym, but really pushing with the, the cardiovascular fitness and the, the heart health and the endurance side. And I love it. It's, it's fun. It's, it's a new challenge. It's unique. And the thing I like about cycling is it's, 
there's so much variety because I mean, you can go out and do all kinds of different routes and you're riding with different people and it's, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, you're outdoors, you know, enjoying it. Whereas I find the gym kind of gets a bit monotonous after a while because it's, you know, you're in the gym, you're lifting weights. Like it's, it's it gets monotonous, <laughs> right? Unless you're training for something specific, again, powerlifting or bodybuilding or whatever, uh, it, it does get monotonous. And I'm just being honest, right? I mean, I still do. I still hit the gym two to three times a week, you know, to maintain my, my strength and, and muscular fitness and that. But my main priority is getting out on the bike, right? Getting outside, enjoying it. And I do mountain biking. I do road cycling. You know, I do both of it. So, I mean, some days it's out in the woods and the trails and enjoying that. Some days it's going down a, a country road, right? And enjoying that. So, I mean, I, I, that's my priority now. So things change, right? I, I wanted to share that story with you to kind of just share the evolution, if you will, of how things progressed. So, you know, I still have a passion for fitness, but it's a different type of fitness that I'm focusing on. And I'm, I'm just as passionate about it now as I've ever been because I always focusing on, you know, what can I improve on? What can I, I focus on and, and get better at? And right now, cardiovascular fitness is, is right up there. And I actually find when it comes to cardiovascular fitness, this is something that you can progress a lot, even in your later years. Like I, a lot of like ultra endurance athletes, I mean, they're guys in their forties and fifties and, and, you know, guys who are old for athletes. And I think a lot of it is because of the mental toughness, you know, you got a lot more mental toughness and patience as you get older versus when you're younger and impatient and nothing happens fast enough, right? So I think that's a, a an advantage mental trait, you know, as you get older, that can certainly help in those areas. Anyway, I've been rambling on long enough. Let's uh, move on. <laughs> uh, Andrew is joining us. Uh, let's see what else he says. He says, uh, I think I missed something there. An Andrew, I'm just getting the second half of a question here, I think. He says, he also promotes main gaining, which I wasted six months time on as I was maintaining a physique, which was far too lean to build muscle. What's your opinion on this? Who's he? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I must have, unless there's something didn't come through there. Unless, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just try to address the question. Main gaining, uh, I wasted six months as I was trying to maintain a physique, which is far too lean to build muscle. What's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, trying to stay too lean can hinder your gains. Because if you're always in a calorie deficit, then what are you going to grow on? So you need to eat, you need to eat to fuel whatever it is that you're doing. And this is something I've really learned a lot of since I focused on endurance training. And I'm just going to give you... Uh, kind of share the way athletes look at endurance or uh, sorry, the way athletes look at nutrition versus bodybuilders and physique competitors, because look, well, bodybuilders have two phases, you know, it's usually the bulk up phase and then there's the contest prep phase. So I'm, I'm going to specifically gear this towards the contest prep phase. When you're in that phase, it's all about depleting yourself, getting as lean as possible like cutting and just stripping off the body fat at all costs. Like if you lose strength, who cares? If you lose your energy, who cares, right? As long as you look lean and you look ripped and, you know, you look good, <laughs> that's all that matters. If you feel like shit, who cares? And that's the way bodybuilders approach it. Like it's, it's who can suffer it out. And when you see bodybuilders at competitions, like they're like walking zombies because they're so depleted and their energy levels are so low and they're just kind of running on willpower and caffeine and pre-workout and whatever other stimulants that they're pumping into themselves. But they're, they're burnt out like, and they're so depleted. They're so lean. Like there's no energy reserves there. Whereas an athlete in any other sport, as they get closer to a competition, they're getting stronger. They're, you know, their, their work capacity, their strength, their, their stamina, everything is improving. So like, just think of uh, like a martial artist. Okay. If he's getting ready for, for a, a, a fight or a tournament or something like that, the closer he gets to that tournament, the better shape he's in. Like he's stronger. He, he's, he's at his best. He's at his peak in terms of physical performance. You think of a cyclist, you know, they peak for the event so that when the event rolls around the race or whatever it is they're doing, 
they're at their peak. They're they're fully you know energized, right? Their their nutrition is matching their activity level. Their body is is in shape, meaning strength and athletic performance wise, and you know. They, they train for performance, whereas bodybuilders, performance doesn't even come into the equation. It's just like, who's the leanest? Who looks the best on stage wearing a pair of underwear? <laughs> like it's a beauty contest for, for who looks the best in their underwear. It, who cares if, if you got no energy? Who cares if, if it, like you, you walk off stage gasping for air because you, you got on there and posed for two minutes? Like strength and performance and all that is, is out the window. And it's all about like deplete, deplete, deplete. And I mean, I fell into this trap. I competed in bodybuilding for 17 years and it was like, did a lot of fasted training, like fasted cardio, you know, low carb this and, and just deplete, deplete, deplete and try to suffer it out to get as lean as possible. And yeah, it works from that point of view, but the strength, like in the months leading up to the contest, you know, like instead of getting stronger coming into the contest, you're getting weaker. And then like the last week before a contest, like you're running on willpower. Like there's no energy. I mean, in the workouts that I would do in the week leading up to a contest, I mean, it was ridiculous. It was like warm up weights that I was struggling with, right? Like the girls in the gym were, were outlifting me. I mean, it's, it's, it's pathetic. Like you got no strength and stamina, like even going for a walk was a struggle. Like everything, you're just literally running on empty and your body fat levels are so low. There's no reserves there. And then your glycogen levels are so low. And Okay, that's what's required to get that ultra lean, single digit shredded body fat, you know, look that bodybuilding requires, but it's not enjoyable. Whereas an athletic performance, whether it's powerlifting or sports or whatever, as you're peaking, it, it's actually enjoyable because you're feeling stronger, you've got more energy, and having a bit of body fat actually helps with that, right? Because you want those reserves. So if you're too lean and you're trying to keep your calories too low, you're going to feel like shit, right? You have to eat for what it is that you're doing. And the way I adjust my nutrition now is I eat for my, what I'm doing. So like if, if I'm having a rest day or a low activity day, I'm going to basically eat maintenance calories. But if I'm doing uh, like this weekend, right? I mean, like for this bicycle ride, man, I'm going to be slamming back carbohydrates like crazy. I mean, I'm going to be shooting for about 75 grams of carbs per hour while I'm doing this ride like constantly slamming back carbohydrates because I want to keep my energy levels topped up so that I don't bomb. So I'm estimating that I'm probably going to be eating probably 8,000 calories a day over the next couple of days, somewhere in that vicinity, just to match the energy demands that I'm going to be outputting. So, I mean, it's no low calorie carb restriction or none of this. Like I'm going to eat for the exercise demands so that I have the stamina and the energy to actually fuel that training. But then after the ride is done and I go back to more normal life, then I'll scale back my calories probably around, you know, uh, 3,000 calories a day, which is kind of like my maintenance. That's where I kind of sit around is 3,000 on a normal day, if you will. A normal day of activity is th usually around 3,000 for me. But this weekend, I'm fully expecting, you know, push five, six, seven, even possibly 8,000 calories. Like I'm not even going to count. I'm just going to fuel based on, on my appetite and, and based on how my body feels. But it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of food, <laughs> right? And constantly slamming back, uh, you know, energy gels and, and carbohydrates throughout the ride itself to keep myself nourished so that I don't get into that low blood sugar state. Anyway, moving on. That was a long-winded question there, or long-winded answer, I should say. Uh, Zach is saying it's never too late. I'm 50 years old. Just bought a chest expander. It's awesome. Good for you. Hey, and you're right. It's never too late because some people look at it. Oh, I'm 50 years old. I'm too old. I'm this and that. Like start now. You're never going to be as young as you are right now. I mean, of course, yeah, it would be nice if you started, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever, but Hey, start now. What, what's the old Chinese proverb? They say, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So like if, if you missed the 20 years ago, Mark, well, start today, right? You're never going to be as young as you are right now. And if you wait, then like you'll roll around. 60 is going to roll around. You're like, oh, shit, I wish I had to start back when I was 50, right? Like start now, regardless of where you are, start now. And to kind of just share this, um, one of my coaching students, uh, Paul Miller, he never exercised a day in his life, you know, structured workouts or anything uh, until he had a heart attack at 62. 
after that, 62, and, you know, the doctors revived him. He survived. And they said, you know, you've been given a gift. You've survived this heart attack. What are you going to do? And that's when he decided, you know, I, I, he's had to make some changes. He had to change his lifestyle because he was eating like shit. He was sedentary. You know, he, he was a school teacher. Right. And he loved his students and he was a bookworm and everything else. I mean, he was always like education, education and let your body go to shit. Right. As long as your mind is healthy, who cares about the body? That was his attitude. And then he realized once he had the heart attack, OK, wait, the body is actually important. Right. You know, if, if you don't have a body, then your mind is useless. Right. So he realized he needed to really change things. And that's when he got involved with fitness and he started, you know, some of the students at the school that he was teaching at, you know, helped them in the in the school gym, helped start teaching them. And some of them took them on under their wing and, you know, uh, you set them up like on a basic workout program and this and that. And and that's why he got them started. And now, I mean, he came on board with with the whole muscle after 40 blueprint coaching program that I run. And here he is now in his late 60s in the best shape of his life. And he started at 62. So like, hey, if, if he can do it starting at 62. Man, you're a young, you're a young lad starting at 50. <laughs> so go for it. Uh, let's see what else we got there. Um, Lee, have you ever used a cambered Swiss bar for benching? I feel more tension on my chest or at the sets. I've never used one. I've seen them. I know what you're talking about, but I've never had access to one. So I have no personal experience with it. Uh, a few guys just were chatting back and forth about Andrew and his main gaining, staying, trying to stay too lean conversation that I went into detail with. So I'm not going to address that. Um, what else we got there? Do, 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 do. Saul saying, great, def a great explanation of deloads. Glad you found that helpful. You're welcome. Uh, we have solid... Gido, Gido, uh, Lee, I've been watching for a couple of years now with what creatine brand would be good for beginners. I prefer a brand that's natural as possible without much bad ingredients. Uh, do I have to take it every day? Creatine, first off, creatine has taken a huge price hike. I, I don't know the whole detail behind it, but I, I went creatine shopping and looking up the prices and it's like it's astronomical the prices have gone through the roof recently and i hear that there's some like a shortage of creatine that's that's the excuse for the price hikes maybe there is maybe there's not who knows but bottom line it's gotten a lot more expensive in recent year or recent weeks uh, than it has been because traditionally it, it went through the full spectrum like when creatine first hit the market back in the mid 90s it was astronomically expensive once it became mainstream then the prices gradually went down and down. And like for the last several years, creatine was like one of the cheapest supplements out there, like best bang for your buck. And now it's it's starting to go through the roof again. But when it comes to creatine, look for a pure creatine monohydrate. And there's a lot of brands and companies that sell this. So don't get too hung up on it, but just look for pure creatine monohydrate. And like if you get into the whole advertising hype, like some companies will say, well, our version of creatine is more absorbable and is better than this and that and the other thing like virtually all the studies that have shown the powerful benefits of creatine have been done utilizing creatine monohydrate and back when creatine hit the market and then took the bodybuilding world by storm because it was one of the few supplements that actually worked it was creatine monohydrate so if it worked back then it still works today and that's all i use personally i use pure creatine monohydrate I actually get mine from a company called CanadianProtein.com. It's it's like this bulk supplement company. They they have their own private labeled protein powders and creatines and amino acids and all this kind of stuff. So I just buy the basically like the the, the raw powders from them, right? Like there's no fancy labeling or, or advertising or whatever. It's just kind of like this private label, you know, stuff. But it's good. It's good. Just pure product. So uh, I get it from uh, CanadianProtein.com is where I get it from. Obviously, they ship within Canada. I'm not sure if they ship to the United States or not. But there's a lot of companies out there that are, offer pure creatine. And just that's all you're looking for, just pure creatine monohydrate powder. And all you have to do is take five grams a day. So basically like a level teaspoon. Yeah, a level teaspoon of creatine. Or if it comes with the scoop, which most of them will, like usually it's a five-gram scoop, take one scoop a day. And that's it. Like, don't overthink it. 
the way creatine works is once you build up a reserve in your system, you're going to reap the benefits of it. So it's, it's not time sensitive. It's not like caffeine where you got to take it before your workout. So it kicks in while you're in the gym. Like creatine doesn't work like that. It doesn't, you know, you take it and then it kicks in. Like as long as you have adequate stores of creatine in your system, you'll reap the benefits of creatine. So you could take it morning, noon or night before a workout, after a workout, it doesn't matter. You could take it on a non-workout day. Like you just want to take it consistently. And, and the way I take creatine is just the same as I take my vitamins, right? When I take my vitamins, I take my creatine. So, I mean, I, I usually take my vitamins after a meal and I just take my creatine along with it. And how I do it is I literally just dry scoop it. So I'll take the five gram scoop, just dump it in my mouth, chase it down with water. Boom. So I, while I'm taking my vitamins, like literally my multivitamin and my B complex and my fish oils and all that stuff, the creatine goes down with it. And I, I do that after I have my breakfast in the morning. So that's, that's the way I do it. And I've been doing that for years. Like literally I've been using creatine pretty much consistently since it first hit the market back in the first time I used it and heard about it was 1995. And it was, that's when it started to become mainstream. Now it probably was out a little bit before then, but it really became mainstream around 95. And again, this was before the internet, right? The internet, as we know, it only became legal in 1996. So, you know, I was just hearing about it in magazines and stuff like that back then in the, in the early nineties. So that's when I started using it and I've been using it pretty much ever since. And it's, it's not a miracle supplement. It's not like, okay, it, it's not as good as the magazine ads try to hype it up to be. Because I remember reading the ads and said, oh, you're going to put on 10 pounds of lean mass. And you're going to put 50 pounds on your bench and look out, right? You're, you're going to get swole because you take creatine. So, I mean, everybody, you know, got caught up on the bandwagon with it. It's not that powerful, but it does work. Like you will feel a little stronger. It will help, you know, more muscle fullness, more strength, more energy. It, it helps to re rejuvenate the ATP adenosine triphosphate which is that high high output energy that explosive energy that's used for uh, low repetition max effort work like very short duration max effort that's what creatine helps to supplement is that max effort work and it also helps to increase your work capacity so it speeds up the, the rejuvenation of that of being able to perform those max effort attempts so when you're in the gym doing heavy lifting like that's where creatine is going to help and it's not massive, but like you'll probably get an extra rep per set. You know, you'll push a little more, uh, feel a little bit more oomph, a little bit more muscle fullness. Right? So, I mean, it helps in those regards. And there's very few side effects. I mean, some people might have a little bit of stomach upset or something like that. But if, if you keep it moderate, like the five grams a day, you shouldn't have any issue. Um, scrap the whole loading phase. Like a lot of companies say, oh, load up, take like 30 grams a day for, for five days or for the first week. And blah. don't like, if you go from no creatine to start slamming back 30 grams of creatine a day, like that's where people can have some upset stomach and issues because you're introducing something that you've never taken before and you're just overdosing on it basically. So introduce it in small amounts, like five grams a day is plenty. And then just let it build up naturally over time. I mean, it, granted it won't get in your system quite as fast as when you load but it'll still get there so like after two or three weeks of five grams a day your, your natural creatine levels are going to be topped up and you just be able to sustain that and that's all you need to do like once they're topped up then you just maintain it and you reap the benefits that creatine has to offer and it goes beyond just the fitness benefits like there's mental and cognitive benefits as well like there's been studies done that shows that creatine actually helps people with mental degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and things like that. Like it actually helps with the mental and cognitive function. So it's not just a sports performance, but it's a mental performance supplement as well. So it's, it's good for overall health in general. It's like even your grandmother could be taking creatine and reaping the benefits from it. But uh, yeah, so hopefully that helps give you an overview of creatine. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth says, wonderful. You're welcome. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Holy shit. I've been going for over an hour. I said I was going to do a short video chat today, but obviously I didn't. So I'm actually going to clue it up guys, because I got family upstairs. Obviously they forgot about me because nobody's become knocking on the door down here to do. <laughs> they haven't come bellowing for me yet. So I guess the, you know, they forgot about me down here. But uh, yeah, I'm going to get ready and clue this up. Uh, I know there's still a lot of questions coming through. Uh, let me just see if there's anything, any final words I want to share before I turn off the video chat today. Um, 
do 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 do. Uh, what else we got there? Thanks for the responses. Uh, I read some scientific articles recently that state that the deltoid muscle has more mass than the chest muscle. I always thought the chest was bigger. Do you agree with the article? Um, I don't know. I've never read that article, but I, I maybe if you're factoring like all the muscles of the shoulders compared to the muscles of the pecs, maybe there is more mass. I, I don't know. Yeah, I really need to look at an anatomy chart and see what it is you're trying to compare here, but it's, you're, you're comparing delts to pecs. Right? I was going to say you're comparing apples to oranges, but you're not. You're comparing delts to pecs. Right. Um, what else we got there? Been tuning in since 2014. That's from Robert. Uh, he says, how do I develop my upper chest? What are the best exercises? I actually discussed this during last week's video chat, I think. But bottom line, prioritize incline bench work. All right? I'm not going to go into a big, long, lengthy discussion on it because I don't have time. But bottom line prioritize incline bench or inc yeah so like incline bench presses incline flies anything that you can do on an incline is going to place more of that emphasis on the upper chest area so if, if that's your weakness scrap the flat bench and use incline bench and don't go too steep like don't have like 45 degrees would be like the max but somewhere probably about 30 30 degrees to 45 degrees in that range depending on you know the the adjustments and the the type of bench you have but that would be the ideal uh, angle to place the maximum emphasis on the upper chest. Got Nathan joining in. Uh, YT is saying starting strength or strong lifts, which is better for beginners? Quite honestly, I wouldn't recommend either for a true beginner. Like if, if you're a brand new beginner, like never worked out before, you need to lay the foundation. And I would actually recommend like some of the beginner workouts that I have on my YouTube channel covering some, some basic machine exercises just to get used to working the muscles. Cause you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take someone who's never exercised before and throw them, you know, into barbell lifts that, that that's more intermediate advanced stuff. So like strong lifts and starting strength and all that, like you, you need to have a foundation before you get into those workouts. So if you're looking for a true beginner workout, check out some of the beginner workout playlists that I have up on my uh, main YouTube channel. Um, Her Harvey's throwing something. I don't know what that was. I don't know if you heard it on the, on the video or not. Something hit the floor upstairs and has vibrated down through the ceiling here in the basement. Uh, Andrew saying, another quick question, if that's okay, is training necessary? I heard compound exercises alone if uh, is enough for abs. Oh, I think he meant is ab training necessary. I heard compound exercises alone is enough for abs and also for calves. Anything is better than nothing. Like look, look at it from that point of view. Like if, if you're doing nothing and you just do something, then something's better than nothing. But if you want optimal development in the abdominals and opti optimal development in the calves, then you're going to have to do some isolation work for those areas, right? Like, again, you got to look at the bigger picture. But personally, I do train my abs, right, because I, I want to focus on strengthening the core. Now, the thing with the abs, it's not a major muscle group. It's not like building your chest or your legs or anything like that like nobody goes in the gym and like hey what's your one rep max sit up right like you know and and nobody's measuring their waistline to try and build it bigger right like you're not trying to build the abs bigger but you want them to be strong uh, so when it comes to training the abs visualize them as stabilizer muscles for your core because that's what they are they're stabilizer muscles for your core and you want to train them and train all areas, you know, the, the frontal abdominals, the upper, lower, you want to train the obliques, you want to train the lower back and think of it, think of the core, like the, the, that whole, think of your, you're building your own internal weightlifting belt is what it is, right? You're strengthening all those muscles around your, your waistline, right? The front, the sides, the back, right? You're, you're building your own internal weightlifting belt to support your core. So uh, when I do ab work, I always focus on that. Like I want to hit all aspects of it and it doesn't have to be high intensity. You know, nobody's going to, you don't need to go in there and blast like 20 sets for ab day or something like that. But I do recommend doing a little bit of work for the abs on a regular basis. So for me, pretty much every workout, I do some core work, 
right? I usually do some stuff for the lower back and some stuff for the, uh, for the abs. And, and I also do some, some work for the obliques, whether it's like various twisting exercises and rotational moves and stuff like that. Um, and I'll vary it. Like I, I don't really have a set rigid structure, but I always make sure to do some work there on a regular basis to just keep those areas in shape. And if you, if you do that on a regular basis, you will notice the difference, right? It'll help to just make you that much more stronger and stable. And it also helps prevent injuries too, because especially as you get older, like lower back injuries and things like that, it's just so common. So if you can strengthen all those stabilizer muscles around your core, and that goes a long way to help them prevent future injuries. All right, guys, I know there's still a ton of questions coming through, but I'm going to have to clue it up because it is getting late. And I got an early rise tomorrow morning. So uh, hopefully you enjoy the video chat. I always enjoy doing them. And I always go longer than I intend to. I always say I'm going to, like today, I said I'm going to stop at a half hour. And here I am, an hour and 10 minutes in, and I'm still going. <laughs> so I over-deliver. I can't help it, right? That's just who I am. I over-deliver. So if you enjoy the video chat, uh, you know, make sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you have any further questions or anything you want to elaborate on that I discussed here that I maybe you know, I didn't address your question or you want more clarification on something, reach out to me. You can send me an email, right? I actually answer my own freaking email. So lee at leehayward.com, send me an email there and we can have a chat or friend me up over on Facebook. I'm very active over there. Just do a search for Lee Hayward on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash lee dot Hayward. That's my uh, Facebook URL. So you can go check me out over there, friend me up. And uh, in the meantime, have yourself a fantastic weekend, and I will talk to you next week, same time, same place. Have yourself a good one. Take care. Over now. Boom.